Hey, 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 Texas Study students, this is Coach Signs, welcoming you back to another one of our video lessons. Today's video lesson is Chapter 14.2 and Texas in the Civil War. Now, the very first thing we're going to talk about today is Confederate government. A man by the name of Francis R. Lubbock was elected as Texas' first Confederate governor under Confederate President Jefferson Davis. So you're probably thinking, Lubbock? Francis R. Lubbock? Yes, the town Lubbock, Texas was named after the gentleman right here, Francis R. Lubbock, who happened to be the first Confederate governor in, in Texas. Now, they were under President Jefferson Davis, who is pictured here in this picture right here, this gentleman right here, who was the first president of the Confederate States of America. Now, this was the South. The Confederate government was the South. If you remember, the North was under Abraham Lincoln. Now, after South Carolina became, became the first a state to secede from the Union, 11 other states seceded after that. The Confederate states demanded that the Union, which was the North, all right, Union represents the northern side, right, with Abraham Lincoln, surrender all military posts uh, in the South. So, the, the Union, or the North, uh, had military posts and military forts in the South still. So what they told them was, hey, you need to get your troops and your people out of the South. The South no longer be, uh, be, is part of the Union and the United States. So, the Union troops refused to leave Fort Sumter in, in Charleston, South Carolina, as you can see in this picture here. Here is... Oops, excuse me, guys. Here is a picture of Fort Sumter. Now, as a refusal of the Union troops uh, leaving the South and leaving Fort Sumter, as you can see in this picture, cannons are being shot towards the American flag, the Union flag, and Fort Sumter. Because, since they didn't want to leave, fighting broke out on April 12th, 1861, and the South was going to defend their lands there in South Carolina. Now, here's another picture of the South attacking Fort Sumter. Fort Sumter was on an island, so on from both sides, the South attacks the North. Now, this marks the beginning of the Civil War. So, essentially, the two main things that start this Civil War happen in South Carolina. Number one, being that South Carolina is the first state to secede from the United States. And number two, because of Fort Sumter and it belonging to the North, this is exactly where the very first battle of the Civil War breaks out and begins. Now, although the Civil War has begun, the very first issue that caused uh, President Lincoln to actually fight back was the fact that he wanted to preserve the Union. So go ahead and write that down, guys. He wanted on the side there. He wanted to preserve the United States. After everything the United States had been through to become a nation and to come to finally come together as a whole nation, for it to crumble apart on something like this, uh, this is exactly what President Lincoln did not want. But eventually, after years, uh, after a couple of uh, months of fighting, and he finally realizes that the true issue here of civil war and the division between the North and the South was the issue of slavery. That the South wanted slaves to be able to run their economy in the North, to help them with the economy in the North, and the North, uh, excuse me, in the South, right, to help the economy in the South, and the North did not want slavery at all. So, to help his cause for this, he brings in the Emancipation Proclamation. Now, President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st of 1863. That made the Civil War's goal to free all slaves in Confederate states or in the South. It also allowed African American soldiers to fight in the Union Army. Here in these next pictures, we have a, a few pictures of a couple of the African-American soldiers that got to fight in the Union Army. 
Now, if you want to go ahead and write this down, guys, go ahead and do it. I think it'll be great for you guys to know that there was 180,000 African-American soldiers that were part of the Union Army and fought against the Confederate South and for their rights. Now, although 180 uh, African-American soldiers fought in the Union Army, unfortunately, 40,000 of them passed away fighting for their rights and their freedom in this civil war. Now the next thing that we're going to focus on is on the Texas volunteers that were fighting in the Confederate South. Now about 70,000 Texans were volunteers, uh, soldiers for the Confederate Army. One of them was John Bell Hood who led Hood's Texas Brigade, uh, Brigade excuse me, to fight against the North in Virginia. Now he was also part of a very important and the most influential battle of the American Civil War. And that battle, guys, is the Battle of Gettysburg. Now, the reason that this is the most influential battle of the American Civil War, and this is also known as a turning point, because up to this point, the South had been winning most of the battles in the Civil War. The Union had taken a lot of losses, or how you, li you guys like to say it, the Union was taking a lot of L's, right? But, at this point, the Battle of Gettysburg is won by the North. The reason being is because the North, with a comeback victory, is able to destroy one-third of the Confederate Army. Now, the Battle of Gettysburg takes place in Gettysburg, uh, excuse me, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Make sure that you write that down on the side, because this is the most influential and the most important battle of the American Civil War, because it turns the tide, and it changes momentum for the North to be able to come back and start a great comeback in this war. Now, the next thing that we're going to talk about is other Texas volunteers that became very famous uh, during the Civil War. Now, these men that we're going to talk about uh, were some Texans that became famous because of their bravery in the Civil War. The first man we're going to talk about is Mr. General, as you should say, General Benjamin Terry, as you can see him in this picture here. Now, he led a group of fighters called the Terry Texas Rangers, and here you can see their flag. The next man we're going to talk about is a, a man by the name of General Lawrence Sol Ross, and he ended up leading what's called Ross's Brigade. Now, the important thing about Mr. Sol Ross, Mr. Sullivan Ross, was that he was a Texas Ranger, he eventually becomes the governor of Texas, or you can't see it in that color, let's go ahead and do it in this one. He becomes the governor of Texas, and he also becomes the president of Texas A&M, University of Texas A&M, currently right now, yes, he becomes a president. Now, also, there's a school named after Mr. Ross, it's called Saul Ross State University, and you know what, guess what? Your very own Coach Signs actually attended Saul Ross State University. It's a Division III school out in West Texas in the town named Alpine, Texas. Now, I went there for a year and a half, and it's I played football there for two seasons. And here are a couple pictures of me, one when I had long hair, and during practice, and this was our game uniform. So this was me. I went to Saul Ross State University. The university that was named after Lawrence Saul Ross, the person that which we are studying. Now, let's focus back on Texas history and see what's going on after the Battle of Gettysburg. Now, after the Battle of Gettysburg, the, remember the Confederate Army lost a lot of soldiers. So, they proposed a Confederate draft. Now, a draft, as you can see here, our keyword there, was the enlisting of persons for required service in the army. Now, there was no more volunteers. This was a required service. You had no choice anymore. The army needed you, 
They were going to call you, they were going to pick you up, they were going to train you, and you were going to fight. Now, the Confederate Army and the Confederate government started a draft that increased the Army's numbers. They did this to be able to pick their numbers back up for the Civil War. However, those that were drafted did not want to serve. I, I repeat, did not want to serve. But yet they were required. And we can see in this picture here, here we have a notice of drafting. And the people who were drafted, right, had to serve a minimum of nine months service. And there it says right there, no more volunteers, right? There will be a notice of drafting. That means they were going to pick you up, like I said, train you and put you out to fight. Now, recently, guys, the latest uh, fight and war that we as a country, the United States, uh, all together were drafting people into was the War of Vietnam. Uh, and that was uh, our common day drafting area. And even then, a lot of people fought that in backlash uh, as well. Just so you get an idea uh, of dates in your head when the Vietnam War was, Vietnam was from the 1960s all the way until up into the mid-1970s. Now, a major part for Texas in the war was the Gulf Coast ports. Now, Civil War battles in Texas took place in Gulf Coast ports. Now, as you can see in this picture, here is a port, right? Now, this port is important because it's able to provide supplies and many things to the people living in the port. So this is why it was important. Since Texas provided weapons, food, and horses for the Confederate, Confederate Army, excuse me, Texans fought northern troops to keep these ports open. So these ports were a huge part of the Confederacy Army. That is why the northern would fight the southerners for the control of these ports to be able to bring in and out the supplies that the Confederate Army needed to be able to fight the North. Now, President Lincoln uh, gets wind of what these, how important these ports really are. So what he does, he orders what's called a blockade. Now, as we can read down here, a blockade is an action to stop transportation of goods into or out of an area. Right. So what President Lincoln does is he ordered a blockade of the southern ports to stop the shipment of supplies to the Confederate Army. Now, by looking at this picture, we can see the number of blockades that President Lincoln had set up. One, he had set up one right here between Virginia and North Carolina. The second one he had set up, he uh, told his army, or excuse me, his navy to set up, was a huge one between South Carolina and Florida. And the last two was the Eastern Gulf Squadron, was, which was from the tip of Florida all the way up to about Alabama. And then the last one was the Gulf Coast, excuse me, the Gulf, the West Gulf Squadron, was, which was from Louisiana all the way down into the Texas border with Mexico. All right, and you can see there, one of the main ones we'll be talking about here in Texas is Galveston. These were the four blockades that uh, President Abraham Lincoln set up. Now, since Galveston was a port, we're going to be talking about the Battle of Galveston Island. Now, this port was an important port to the state of Texas and to the Confederate troops. Now, the Union sees how important this port is, and they, take the, they attack the island, and they take it. However, Confederates invest supplies and ships and men into this island, and they're able to launch an attack and retook the island until the end of the Civil War, and being able to control it. Now we're going to talk about the last land battle of the Civil War. Now, the last land battle of the Civil War was fought on May 12th through 13th of 1865 at Palmito Ranch, which is near Brownsville. You're probably thinking, Coach, wait, Brownsville, like the one that is about an hour away? Yes, Brownsville, Texas, right here in the Rio Grande Valley, the last major land battle of the Civil War took place here. Now, here is a depiction of the battle at Palmito Ranch. 
Now the next picture shows us a, a drawing, excuse me, a painting of how the land and the soldiers line up on that fateful day, uh, uh, the two days of battle. So historically, Brownsville has a lot of bloodshed towards the Civil War and towards the United States. Now, unaware that Confederate General Robert E. Lee had already surrendered, the North forces battled the Confederates for two days, and they fought. Now, although Confederates had won the battle, they had already lost the Civil War. And here's why they had lost Civil War. A whole month before this, a whole month before this, General Lee, Robert E. Lee, right here, is signing the Order of Surrender for the South, thus making the South and the Confederate States the losers and guaranteeing that Ulysses, Ulysses, e, uh, excuse me, Ulysses Grant and the Union win the Civil War. Now you're probably thinking, why in the world would it take them a whole month not to find out what's going on, right? But, since they did not have the same communication skills in the armies like they do today with these satellite, excuse me, these satellite phones and these walkie-talkies, they could not send out those informations to be like, hey, you know what, dude, uh, we, uh, we, we closed this deal off about a month ago. I don't know why in the world you guys are fighting. So, Another thing that they didn't have, what you guys use today, is Snapchat. So it's not like Robert E. Lee could take this picture right here, Snapchat this, or post a story about, hey, you know what? I'm surrendering uh, to the U.S. Army and to the Union. So all of you in Palmito Ranch, just go ahead and pack up your stuff and just go and head on home because this show is over. Right? They couldn't do that because they didn't have the, the, the means or the the technology to be able to communicate on Snapchat like you guys do today. This concludes our lesson on Chapter 14.2 and Texas in the Civil War. Make sure that you like my YouTube channel, Coach Signs Altogether, and subscribe as well. Now, this is Coach Signs, signing out.